Two of you already used Dask somewhere. I tried it out. Yeah. And two of you used Mapchete. Okay. Thanks, Tina. <laughs> Good. So a short introduction. Uh, I am from a company called EOX. Uh, we are based in Vienna. That's a larger town next to the Danube River. Um, we are mainly my team is mainly working with uh, processing of large uh, archives of satellite imagery, mainly Sentinel-2. Um, so we are producing uh, exploitation-ready uh, products out of it and cloudless mosaics. Um, who of you already heard of the Sentinel-2 cloudless layer? Okay, yeah, thanks. For the ones of you who didn't know, you can go to this uh, website. Oh, does it work? Ah, yeah, this. S2Maps.eu. Um, you can view the uh, global 10 meter uh, cloudless mosaic of Sentinel 2. And you can also use the WMS uh, in non commercial terms. So you can load it into QGIS and use it as an additional layer, for example. So, what is Mapchete? Mapchete is a, a, a tool, a open source, written in Python. You can find it on GitHub. Um, but what is it exactly? So it's mainly, it's a processing engine, first and foremost. So it runs custom processes uh, on potentially very large uh, geospatial data. And it's also a set of command line tools that help you to achieve this. Um, how does it work? So it's very simple. So we are using the WMTS uh, tile matrix system um, to chop up the space into smaller chunks and process each of, each of the chunks individually. So there's not much matching in there, but yeah, it's a very powerful system. And what's also important, it uh, allows to save the processing recipe. So once you have a processing output uh, and you have the configuration and the code next to it, you can always reproduce what you would have processed, which can be quite useful in some time. Uh, why is this useful? So yeah, large or even global uh, data cannot be processed at once. I mean, for the ones of you who deal with uh, raster imagery, you probably would have already had the situation more than once that your laptop feels too small for the data you're going to convert or to process or whatever. So you need to find a, so MapChat should help in um, achieving a large scale processing with this. And yeah, the other processing steps and recipes um, are preserved. So what do we need for this? So we need, first and foremost, we need, of course, a process. So for example, a hill shade would be a process. And we need a configuration for it. So that's basically the points to the process and points to the inputs and the output format. Very simple. How does a process look like? I hope you can see it. I wasn't able to make it any larger. So it's, it should be written in Python. And it can, can be either a Python file or a module. Uh, with uh, The only constraint is it has to have a function called execute. And this execute function should and it makes sense to have some, some input arguments and some uh, keyword arguments uh, with that. And Mapchete would then use the configuration and map whatever you define in the configuration to your processing function. And within the function, you can do whatever you want. So you can use familiar tools like NumPy if you're dealing with raster data or Shapely if you're dealing with vector data. So it's com completely up to you what what's happening in, inside. Um, the configuration is also very simple. So we are using the YAML syntax. Um, and the only things you have to define is, of course, the process itself. Then inputs would be useful, outputs, and then some additional data if you want, and the processing parameters. And yeah. And with these two things, the process output is perfect reproducible. Um, in addition to this, so what do we need? So we need a set of commands, of course. So um, Mapchetta ships with a set of command line tools, which will help you. So the most important, of course, is execute. Um, and yeah, if you're finished with your process, you can simply run Mapchetta execute and point to the process file, right? Um, and then you have some additional flags. So if you just want to do a subset of, of what you're intending to do, then you can add the bounce parameter, for example, or only process certain zoom levels. Um, data format, so internally we are using uh, Rasteria and Fiona. Uh, they're both based on, on GDAL and OGR, so basically everything that can be read by them can be read by Mapchete. 
but we also have some special uh, extensions. So, um, for example, we can read and write uh, SAR archives, and we have an extension called mapchete.io, which allows us to read from satellite archives. Um, the default format is called tile directory. Uh, it's a bit of a special one uh, because you know when you when you are producing a, a large output that wouldn't fit into one GeoTIFF anymore, you have to find some solutions how to achieve this. And again, here the WMTS system comes to rescue. So it's basically a tile directory is is very much like a, a map cache you would have, but with the one exception that you, you're not restricted to using PNGs or JPEGs, but you can use GeoTIFFs, for example, or also a vector format like flat geo buff. Uh, and with GeoTIFF, you have the advantage that you're not restricted to the 8-bit uh, data range, but you can use whatever you want, so floats, yeah. And you can store a global high-resolution output with this. It's also really nice because you can do a regional updates and um, it allows you, of course, to write and update in parallel, which is important for scalability. So if you have a lot of workers writing on the same output, then you also want to be, uh, then you also want your output format to be able to handle this. If you had a single file, single file, you would have to find some locking mechanism and then have the workers write in, in sequence, sequence, which would not be that efficient. Uh, for this tile directory, uh, we worked on a uh, stack extension. Oops. It's called tiled assets, assets extension. And it's basically, it replaces the URL to the single TIFF, for example, with a schema. So you find it like here. So you have zooms, rows, and columns. And, oops, right. getting confused here? Yes. Uh, and since uh, GDAR 3.6, I believe, we, have, we also have a GDAR driver. So you can imagine that this stack.json, which is already a stack item, it's like a VRT and steroids. So if you were using VRTs, for example, in a, a VRT is an XML GDAR format, which points to every uh, TIFF file uh, you want to add to your, to your VRT. Uh, the, Stack the file is more efficient because it doesn't store the single parts, but only the schema to the parts. And it can be loaded, because it's a cheater drive, it can be loaded into QGIS and even from S3. Um, so, for example, here, yeah, you would see it like this. QGIS. So, let's move on to parallelization. So, Mapchete internally, uh, it creates tasks and then decides uh, on, on how, to, how to process these tasks. So, the most simple case would be no parallelization, of course, so do it in sequential. Then, also, it can do it uh, in, in parallel using the Python concurrent futures, concur concurrent futures uh, multiprocessing capability. And, as an addition, it can use Dask. So, what is Dask? For the ones of you who don't know yet, Dask is a Python library for parallel and distributed computing. It's very nice because it replicates the concurrent futures API, so you can have both of them in your code uh, in parallel and yeah, abstract it really nicely. Um, also, a nice feature of Dask is you can have task graphs. So, for example, your tasks can depend on each other, uh, which also helps if you're, if you're processing a lot of, a lot of things. Uh, then Dask would help you to, to efficiently decide which tasks uh, should be done when and, yeah, and where. And if you look at this task graph, it should remind you of something. Yes, exactly. It's a tile pyramid again. So, if you're building a large tile pyramid with a lot of overviews, then you can use the task graphs, for example comes really handy. So how do we integrate it? Um, as I told you before, we have these three versions, so sequential, uh, concrete futures, and Dask. Uh, internally in the code, we of course abstract it away using executor classes. Uh, and to go into detail, the Dask executor, it wraps around Dask and handles all the, the task um, execution. Internally, Dask will then uh, connect to, to a a uh, service called the task scheduler, so it can be on your local machine, uh, another process, or it can be an external service. Um, 
we are using uh, Mapchete then internally and deploy it as a service and we call this Mapchete Hub. So Mapchete Hub is basically the Mapchete processing engine in the core and we, we are adding uh, a deployment infrastructure around this. So this allows us to do some asynchronous processing so because you can imagine if you do a large scale thing then it will not finish early so you would need to wait for, for a time, for a couple of hours for example. So this is why asynchronous is very important. We use it for EOX Cloudless and EOX Maps and also for some agri use cases. And the interface we, uh, we implemented is OGC API processes like, I say like because we did it like two years ago and uh, uh, the specification evolved so we have to review that uh, eventually. But it's really, I would say it's like 95%, it's the OGC RP processes. So and this is how it works. So we have Mapchete Hub, it has in the core, it has the processing engine and then a task client. It's connected via REST interface, we're using FastAPI for this. And we deployed it uh, over Kubernetes. So we have a, and in Kubernetes we have a task gateway. It's a, a, package maintained by the Dask community and the Dask gateway, you, uh, in the Dask gateway, the client can request the Dask cluster. So, and it works that way, the user or IE us, we post the job, then Mapchete Hub would then look at the job configuration and the inputs and the outputs and then determine the tasks he has to do, build internally either a Dask graph, so if dependencies are required or uh, apply task screaming and then if it's finished with that, it requests a task cluster and then Kubernetes will handle all the auto scaling things. So if you have a small job, it will just request like one worker. If you have a large job, it will request, yeah, whatever you set to the maximum. Uh, yeah, and of course then it sends the task to the cluster and waits until they're ready. And in the meanwhile, it tracks the progress and tracks the progress in a, in a MongoDB in the background. So you could always, so you, Basically, you post a job, you get an ID back, and then you can pull the job, and it will tell you the percentage of, of progress. And in the end, it cleans up and is finished in the best case. But of course, the best case doesn't always happen. <laughs> so we are, we are using this since, so the, we are using Dask since three years now. So before that, we had a system using uh, Celery. And we really had a steep learning curve and went through a lot of pain <laughs> in order to get the, the output ready because uh, we struggled with a lot of random exceptions so Dask is really not great in providing you useful information of what went wrong so it took us in between a long time to figure out what went wrong uh, what we found out we had a lot of connection errors uh, so things we cannot do uh, much about because it's deployed on AWS uh, and we also got random workers killed, so eventually we found out, oops, they were running out of memory. So, yeah, we learned through the, through, it, through the years how we could massage everything so it goes as smoothly as possible. We also found out that uh, large task graphs uh, also would, would cause the, the cluster to fail. So, yeah. And, yeah, uh, very important is the memory consumption. So when you write the Mapchete process, you should keep in mind that it runs on some machine and if you are initializing a large array in like, I don't know, float 32, then this machine may break and Dask may know nothing about this and throw you a random error. So it, it's not intelligent enough to point you to, to the fact that, hey, you're using too much. It just says, hey, I've killed the worker because something's going wrong. With that. It's really annoying, I can tell you. But yeah, if everything uh, runs smoothly, then you uh, really have a nice system where you can yeah, do large things and great things. And yeah, so here you see a Grafana dashboard um, with the yeah, uh, hardware consumption for our cloudless mosaics. And yeah, a nice feature of Dask is also that every Dask scheduler ships with a, uh, with a dashboard. So if you have the URL of the dashboard, you can log into it and see what's happening on the cluster. And in the best case, you end up with a cloudless mosaic, in that case of Estonia. So I was faster than expected.
because I'm already finished. I would like to point you to the fact that um, uh, we are also having a talk about View Server later in the afternoon in this very room. So, thank you very much. All right, uh, thank you for your talk. Now we have the chance to ask some questions. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I w I'm interested in these connection errors. Uh, we have similar uh, problems also. Uh, um, are these? Uh, do you have? Can you give some insight? Uh, what they're due? Is it also due to um, connections between the uh, the file server and um, and and the, the processing node, or what is it about in in your case? <laughs> if we would only know. I mean, in some cases it was, so for example, if the task graph is too large and the specs of the scheduler is too narrow, then the scheduler would simply then be irresponsive and you get a connection error. The same in some cases with the workers. So as you can imagine, we are reading a lot of data. So uh, like Andrea showed you before, so a lot of Sentinel products at the same time. So you, we have a lot of IO strain on the, on the workers. This could also cause the workers to be irresponsive. So the task scheduler, of course, it always checks on the workers and sends pings out. So, hey, are you alive? And if they don't respond, then, yeah. Uh, there are some internal retry mechanisms, and we played around with that. But yeah, eventually, it could always happen that, yeah. So if I understand well, it's So it's rather between the, the scheduler and the processing nodes, this connection that is uh, lost, right? Yeah, or from the client to the scheduler as well, if the scheduler dies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Okay. So basically, every uh, um, every uh, part of the whole system can fail, and if one essential part of the system fails, like the scheduler, then your job is gone. And there's nothing you can do about this except of retry. Yeah. But we also managed to uh, max out the AWS S3 uh, rate sometimes because when you have like 100 or 200 workers writing at the same time on S3, then even Amazon crumbles. Yeah, thanks for the great presentation. You mentioned that at the beginning for MapShetty you can do raster and vector data. I'm just wondering if you could give an example of how you used it for a large vector data set. You mentioned shape, please. So would it be things like intersections, buffers, generalizations? Um, yeah, for our maps, I mean, it's already a couple of years back we, we used it to generate uh, global contour lines, for example. So we had a, a, like a global, what was it, 30 meter elevation data. And we used this tile-based approach to extract the contour lines and write them into a PostGIS database afterwards. Okay. But yeah, of course, the vector capabilities is a little bit limited due to the fact that you're processing tiles. So if you have larger features than a tile, then it gets split up, and this is not always what you want. Yeah. Yeah, thank you for this. Um, at the moment, I use for example for hill shading. GDAL dem uh, hill shade, but I saw your example. Is it basically that you support all the parameters that uh, we can use in GDAL dem hill, sh hill shade? Yeah, we, we don't have access to the internal GDAL hill shade uh, implementation. Okay. So I use the Python based approach, but there you have the. Are you referring to the three parameters you need? So the. Actually, yeah, the, the of course, there's yeah. like the ordinary parameters like azimuth and and yeah. but um, I, I use some other parameters like multi-directional compute edges. Oh, and well, you can you can call the hillshade function multiple times with multiple parameters. Okay, um, in in you, you would have to write a custom process for this, but yeah, definitely possible. Okay. We do the same, so we have a custom hillshade on our maps as well, and yeah. I'm, Okay. I was using the same approach. Thank you. We'll try it out. Yeah.
Um, this uh, tile-based approach uh, for data processing seems really uh, interesting, but for me it's always the question, so is there anything uh, to facilitate development of algorithms and data processing pipelines when you have like uh, something that requires not only local pixel information, but also the neighborhood around or probably some global things that need to be calculated on a whole uh, image or some larger region so that you have like spillover from one tile to another of data to just to get a result in a single tile. Uh, yeah, that's an excellent question. I mean, the Hillshade example is, uh, is a good example for this. So yeah, we have a... Um, uh, I cannot show you. We have a, a parameter you can define uh, when you define your process pyramid that's called pixel buffer, and it would add to every process tile a, a buffer of this and clip it away afterwards. Um, I mean, you can use it within reason. I mean, getting the whole image information, yeah, you, theoretically you have the path of the image somewhere and get it and have to open it in Rasterio and then get the information out of it. But uh, near neighborhood, yeah, it's it's there. It was, uh, creating the heel sheet was the first use case for this tool, so having the pixel buffer was also one of the first features. Yeah. Um, I would have a question. Um, I found it interesting that you used this OGC API processes. So um, just out of interest, are you satisfied with the standard and the stuff you um, did differently, um, would you suggest it to add this to the standard? Um, we added one thing for us, which was uh, the uh, posting of processes, which was not really that difficult. Mean, the ideas were there like two years ago, but it, there was not a specification for this. Um, I heard that meanwhile it is there, I have to review this. But this was the major deviation we had from this. All right. Yeah. Okay, then uh, thanks again, uh, Joachim. So a warm applause for him. <laughs> thanks. <laughs>